thank you all for joining us today uh, to discuss this important uh, issue regarding uh, crack and powder cocaine, sentencing disparity, the Equal Act. My name is Matthew Charles, and I'm going to start us off by telling a little bit about myself. And then we'll hear from Congressman Bobby Scott and some other leaders on this issue. And then I'll turn it over to our panel uh, of experts. In 1996, I was sentenced to 35 years due to the disparity between the two drug types. Uh, this disparity caused my sentence to be increased for 20 years longer than it would have been had it been for powder cocaine. I take accountability for my wrong actions, but 15 years would have been the sentence that I received for my illegal conduct. Uh, when I went to prison with this type of sentence, it did put me in a depressive state, a hopeless state, and it was only by the grace and through God that I was able to not allow uh, anger or bitterness to take root within me. However, there are still many that are bound with sentences that are increased anywhere from seven, 10, to 20 years due to this disparity that we all now understand is unwarranted, unnecessary, burdensome, and racially disparate. The Equal Act removes these things and brings equity uh, to the sentencing and writes this three decades old wrong where we fail to understand the difference between powder cocaine and crack cocaine and through fear increase the penalties to 100 to 1. Uh, we understand that today is 18 to 1, but that disparity still is a difference between anywhere from, like, as I stated earlier, 7 to 15 years. Uh, so we want to do away with that. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, to you Congressman Bobby Scott. Congressman Scott has represented Virginia's third congressional district in the United States House of Representatives since 1993. For years, he has been a leading advocate for reforming our nation's criminal justice system. He has successfully worked to pass bipartisan legislation to reduce mandatory minimum sentences, reform the juvenile justice system, and require the reporting of deaths that occur while in custody. He is also a lead co-sponsor of the Equal Act and a strong voice for this needed reform. Hi, I'm Congressman Bobby Scott. It's a pleasure to join you in today's virtual briefing hosted by Families Against Mandatory Minimums and Prison Fellowship to discuss the bicameral and bipartisan Equal Act, which will eliminate the sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine. This, of course, is a relic of the failed war on drugs. In 1986, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act created a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine. In practice, this meant that a person caught dealing 500 grams of powder cocaine would receive the exact same punishment as a person caught with five grams of crack cocaine. This sentencing disparity had a racially disparate impact on black communities, did nothing to change behaviors and wasted taxpayer money. Studies have shown that there are no pharmacological differences between crack and powder cocaine. However, at one point, more than 80% of people convicted in federal court for crack offenses were African-American, while only 27% of those convicted of powder cocaine were African-American. The crack cocaine sentencing disparity forced judges to impose higher penalties for very small amounts of crack and had the bizarre effect of punishing those lower in the drug distribution change much more severely than drug kingpins. The Equal Act is an important step in fixing our criminal justice system. The tireless work of returning citizens and organizations such as Prison Fellowship, FAM, the ACLU, and the NAACP helped pass the 2010 Fair Sentencing Act, which reduced the sentencing disparity to 18 to 1. However, that bill was a compromise and still reflects the failed tough on crime approach to public safety. That's why we have to pass the Equal Act to end this disparity once and for all. But frankly, instead of arguing about whether someone should receive an arbitrary mandatory minimum or some other draconian punishment, we really should be investing in early education, workforce training, and our communities. So thank you for convening this panel, and I look forward to working with all of you to pass the Equal Act. Thank you, Congressman Scott, for your comments and, being, and for being one of the leaders regarding this vital discussion. I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Nina Patel, our moderator for today. 
Nina is a former public defender who now works as legislative counsel to Congressman Bobby Scott, Nina Patel. Thank you so much for that, Matthew. And thank you for all of you for joining us on this important uh, congressional briefing for eliminating a quantifiably unjust application of the law, also known as the Equal Act. This briefing is hosted by Prison Fellowship and Families Against Mandatory Minimums, FAM. For those of you joining us today, if you're looking for the text of the bill, that's going to be under HR 1693, and the Senate Companion Bill is Senate Senate Bill 79, so 79. Um, today's bill uh, that's in the House is also being led by Representatives Hakeem Jeffries, Congressman Bobby Scott, Congresswoman Kelly Armstrong, and Congressman Don Bacon. So it is a bipartisan bill. Joining us today to talk about the important issue of sentencing reform with regard to the crack cocaine disparity um, are a wonderful group of panelists. Um, these are experts from a wide range of backgrounds. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists. Today we have Nikichi Taifa. She is the founder and CEO of the Taifa Group LLC, a social enterprise firm whose mission is to advance justice. She also convenes the Justice Roundtable, a broad network of advocacy groups advancing progressive justice system reforms. Nikichi has an illustrious history of civil rights advocacy. Notably for today's conversation, as the Justice Roundtable convener, Nikichi was in the leadership of a vital coalition responsible for passage of the Fair Sentencing Act crack disparity legislation in 2010. That changed the law from a disparity of 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. Also joining us today is Amra Ahmad. Amra Ahmad is a senior policy counsel at the American Civil Liberties Union's National Political Advocacy Department, where she advocates for federal criminal justice reform. In her prior work with the federal public and community defenders, she oversaw national litigation strategy to implement the crack retroactivity provisions of the First Step Act. That work contributed to reducing sentences for thousands of people incarcerated under racially unjust crack cocaine laws. Also joining us today is Frank Russo. Frank Russo is the Director of Government and Legislative Affairs at the National District Attorneys Association, also known as the NDAA. With more than 5,500 members nationwide, NDAA is recognized as the leading source of national expertise on the prosecution function. Prior to joining NDAA, Frank worked on Capitol Hill as a law clerk with both the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary and the U.S. House Subcommittee for Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security. Also joining us today is Heather Rice Minus. She serves as Senior Vice President of Advocacy and Church Mobilization at Prison Fellowship, the nation's largest Christian nonprofit serving prisoners, former prisoners, and their families. She's a powerful, knowledgeable voice articulating the case for restorative criminal justice solutions and how churches can play a critical role in meeting the needs of those impacted by crime and incarceration. Thank you to all of our panelists joining us here today to discuss this important reform effort and this bill. I'm going to go ahead and start off our discussion with some questions, but for those of you who are interested in asking questions, you can um, provide those in the chat function today, and we'll be getting to those towards the end of the discussion, but be sure to put them in the chat function on the side if you can see the little um, icon at the bottom of your screen. So I'm going to lead off with a question for Nikichi. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful, Nina. How are you? I'm so happy you could join us here today. So Nikichi, um, can you explain to all of us here, how did we get to this point? How did we get here? And why did Congress create this original sentencing disparity? What prompted the reduction um, that we saw in 2010 as well? Okay, first of all, thank you, fam. Thank you, Prison Fellowship for bringing us together. Thank you, Congressman Scott. And thank you, Matthew Charles. Congratulations for everything that you've accomplished since you have been home and my fellow panelists. So in 1986, we're talking about uh, 36 years ago, crack cocaine was 
hyped across the country as an urban menace that would spawn a generation of crack babies and an epidemic of violence. The public knew very little about crack other than the belief later to be found erroneous that nationally acclaimed basketball star Lynn Bias had died from a crack cocaine overdose. As a result, the congressional record was inundated with sensationalized news articles about crack, although there was a lack of rationally sound data and analysis, Congress, both Democrats as well as Republicans alike, nevertheless concluded that crack cocaine warranted especially severe penalties and mandated that a mere five grams of crack cocaine, the weight of a couple of packs of sugar would carry the same five-year sentence as 500 grams of powdered cocaine. This 100 to one distinction between the two forms of the same drug was essentially plucked out of a hat. Fast forward to uh, 1993. At that time, Amara was legislative counsel for the ACLU policy office. Those were the days when the Omnibus Crime Bill in 1994 were discussed, drafted and debated in Congress. The United States Sentencing Commission issued a call, a public call for comment on a variety of issues, including the deferential in sentencing between crack and powder cocaine. And Nina, a colleague from the Federal Public Defender Service, suggested that I focus the ACLU's comment on the cocaine disparity, an issue that I was completely ignorant about at the time. Again, there was this was 1993, at a time when public opinion on the disparity was undeveloped. Research was sparse and racism in cocaine sentencing had not yet been taken very seriously. And even myself, despite my civil libertarian background, I approached this subject with skepticism. I was aware of the devastation that crack had wreaked on communities of color. I was also influenced by media images. And I assumed that because young black men were so often shown in the media spread eagled on the ground by the police on the way to the morgue from crack cocaine abuse, that they were the primary abusers and dealers in that substance. I could not have been more wrong. I found that research and statistics from the National Institute on Drug Abuse documented that the majority of crack users were white. I was intrigued by these statistics and I surmised that it was the greater deployment of law enforcement resources in communities of color coupled with legislation mandating harsher mandatory minimum sentences uh, for crack and powder that was the cause for the astronomical rise in the arrest, prosecutions, convictions, and imprisonments of Blacks. And my personal initial hesitancy was quickly transformed into zealous advocacy. In October 93, Congressman um, Charles Rangel sponsored the Crack Cocaine Equitable Sentencing Act, which equalized the penalties between crack and powder of cocaine. And in 1995, the United States Sentencing Commission completed its mandated study, transmitted to Congress its report, along with amendments to equalize the penalties for crack and powder cocaine possession and distribution at the current powder cocaine uh, um, uh, you know, triggers. The commission's recommendations were summarily rejected by Congress. Ironically, just two days after the historic march, where a million black men converged at the steps of the Capitol demanding justice and equality. But even more egregiously, Congress demanded that the commission revise its equal recommendations so as to maintain sentences for crack cocaine trafficking that exceeded those for powder cocaine. I just wanna say that this was a sober, it was a crushing defeat, and it was compounded when President Clinton signed the legislation gutting the commission's efforts to equalize. So as I'm coming down to a close in this 15 year review of guideline sentencing, the US Sentencing Commission reported, and I'm quoting, they said that revising this one sentencing rule would do more to reduce the sentencing gap between crack and uh, sentencing gap between blacks and whites than any other single policy change. And it would drastically improve the fairness of the um, federal sentencing um, system. So in March of 2010, years later, the unprecedented finally occurred. Progressives and conservatives in the Senate joined together to rectify the missed opportunities of the past which are, with a compromise which completely eliminated the disparity only for simple possession of crack cocaine and then reduced from 101 to 18 to one for distribution. Again, 
another number plucked out of a hat and none of the provisions were retroactive. In conclusion, what do we know now that we did not know then? We did not know in 1993 when I first started working on this issue that crack cocaine and powder cocaine are pharmacologically identical and have similar effects differing only in their manner of ingestion. That both forms of the drug are dangerous, but one is not more dangerous than the other. That the term crack baby is now widely understood to be a misnomer with research indicating that the negative effects of both prenatal crack and powder cocaine exposure are identical and no more severe than the impact of alcohol or tobacco on the fetus. That significantly less trafficking related violence it's associated with crack than was previously assumed in any cases involving weapons are subjected to the stiff mandatory minimum sentence for use of a weapon in connection with a drug trafficking offense or otherwise enhanced penalties under the guidelines. But finally, perhaps the most persuasive thing is that it's only a mere frying pan and baking soda that stands between powder and crack. Thus, to apply a stiffer penalty for cocaine that is sold directly as crack, as opposed to powder cocaine easily transformed into crack is irrational. We must pass the Equal Act now. Thank you. Nikichi, thank you so much for that history and explanation. I've never had such an exciting science class <laughs> to understand that the substances are essentially the same, but it's preparation that changes it and somehow has created this very um, much higher penalty for crack uh, offenses. And so that was insightful and wonderful. Following up on that discussion, I'm gonna ask Amra now to talk a little bit more about some of the disparity um, that this law has caused in, and it shows in the numbers when we look at the Sentencing Commission reports. Um, Amra, if you could tell us all a little bit about how has this disparity impacted communities of color and any information you can share with us about, you know, the impact of just this one difference in the law and what it means to communities and people who have been living without their loved ones, um, the way that Matthew Charles has described in his personal experience. Sure. Well, first, Nina, I'd like to thank you, um, Matthew Charles, FAM and Prison Fellowship for having us here today on this panel and for organizing all of us to talk about this important issue. To answer your question, um, even now today, even after the Fair Sentencing Act of 2010 reduced the disparity from 101 to 18 and 1, the current ratio promotes unwarranted disparities based on race. Nationwide statistics compiled by the Sentencing Commission reveal that Black people are more likely to be convicted of crack cocaine offenses, while white people are more likely, likely to be convicted of powder cocaine offenses. Thus, the sentencing disparities punishing crack cocaine offenses more harshly than powder cocaine offenses unjustly and disproportionately penalize Black people for drug trafficking comparable to that of white defendants. Compounding the problem is the fact that based on evidence that white people are disproportionately less likely to be prosecuted for drug offenses in the first place. When prosecuted, they're more likely to be acquitted and even if convicted are much less likely to be sent to prison. Most crack users um, were and still are white according to federal surveys, but black people were sent to federal prison nearly seven times more often for crack offenses from 1991 to 2016. So that number persisted even after passage of the Fair Sentencing Act in 2010. And from 1991 through 1995, the ratio was more than 13 blacks in prison for every white person locked behind bars. In 2019, according to the United States Sentencing Commission at the federal level, over 80% of people prosecuted for crack offenses were Black. Um, in 2019, um, that number persisted, even though white and Hispanic people, like I said, have historically accounted for over 66% of crack cocaine users. And as with all mandatory minimum sentencing laws, the goal of targeting high-level drug traffic, excuse me, high-level drug traffickers has failed. 
Congress made it explicitly clear when they first enacted mandatory minimum penalties that they wanted to target quote unquote serious drug traffickers or major drug traffickers. They also use the word drug kingpins. But the opposite has proven to be true as mandatory penalties for crack offenses apply most often to offenders who are low level participants in the drug trade. So again, according to recent sentencing commission data, the majority of people who are sentenced for crack offenses have only low level involvement such as street level dealers, couriers who are moving the drug on the street or lookouts. And these racial disparities are even more troubling considering the devastating collateral consequences that the nation's drug policy and mandatory minimums have on black and brown people. In 1986, before the enactment of the, any federal mandatory minimum sentencing laws, the average federal drug sentence for black people was 11% higher than for whites. After enactment of those laws in 1986, the average federal drug sentence for black people was 49% higher. And by the year 2000, there were more black men in prison and jails than there were in higher education, leading scholars to conclude that our crime policies are a major contributor to the disruption of black families and communities. The effects of these mandatory minimum sentences also separate fathers from families, they separate mothers with sentences for minor possession crimes or who are involved in conspiracies and get sentenced the same way that a higher level participant gets, sent gets sentenced. They create massive disenfranchisement of those with felony convictions and prohibit previously incarcerated people from receiving some social services for the betterment of their families. Fast forward to 2021, and one out of every three Black boys born today can expect to go to prison in their lifetime, as can one of every six Latino boys, compared to one of every seven, excuse me, one of every 17 white boys. Um, and at the same time, women continue to continue to be the fastest growing incarceration, incarcerated population in the United States. And this is in large part because of all of our drug laws. And I think that the Equal Act gives us the opportunity to revisit one major drug law that has had a really devastating impact on, on largely on black communities um, and to begin to rewrite history and right the wrongs that started in 1986 based on numerous misunderstandings and myths that Nikichi outlined earlier. Thank you so much for that, Amra. Um, as a person who's practiced in federal court, Amra has a wealth of knowledge about how these sentences work um, and highlighting kind of the trends that we're seeing in the you know, the Sentencing Commission, that the, the statistics are showing this kind of disparity, um, I think is really important. So thank you for highlighting that information. And, and when we talk about treating people equally under the law, this is a prime example, right, Amra, of a law that treats people in the same position very unfairly as a, a person who might have five grams of, you know, um, crack cocaine and someone who has powder cocaine, they're going to get vastly different sentences. Right, Amra? That's right. Um, the difference is astounding that um, to trigger the five-year mandatory minimum, for example, for powder cocaine, uh, the government would have to prove that 500 grams or more of powder cocaine were involved in the offense, whereas for crack cocaine today, even after the Fair Sentencing Act, it's only 28 grams. And if there were a scientific justification or public health justification or any justification for that, then we might not be having this conversation. But as Nikichi pointed out earlier, these were numbers that were pulled out of a hat in 1986. Not only the numbers, the drug quantity numbers that trigger the sentences, but also the sentencing numbers themselves, five years as opposed to two years. These are all numbers that were pulled out of a hat. They're completely arbitrary. Um, and even the Fair Sentencing Act, although it made tremendous progress reducing the disparity, 
the 18 to one ratio that we have today was just a part of a negotiation and it was where the parties landed, but that's not how we should make decisions about our criminal justice system. It's not like negotiating the price of a car. Um, it should be, these should be numbers that are based on evidence, based on data, and there just isn't any evidence or data to back up that the fact that these two things are treated differently. So the Equal Act resolves that, it tries to address that. And I think it's great also that it has a retroactive provision to correct sentences in the past that were unjust. I think those are excellent points. And I think if anything, you're absolutely right. We don't make policy the way we bargain for a car. Um, what, a, what an astute point. Um, to follow up on that, I'm gonna ask Frank now, um, who has a very you know interesting perspective as someone who heads up the um, an organization of prosecutors and understands the needs of, you know, uh, crime victims and public safety. Frank, could you tell us a little bit about um, how the elimination of the disparity would align with our public responsibility to keep communities safe? Because that's always going to be a part of the discussion. Um, what does this law look like to you? Um, does it align with public safety? Um, and you know any insight you can give us um, from your role um, where you uh, are working now, and you were a former staffer too. So <laughs> I think a lot of people can commiserate with um, you know someone who's working at, on both ends. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Nina, and thank you to Fan and Prison Fellowship. And I agree. I, I don't miss the days of having to to deal with those arbitrary discussions and, and trying to make up policy as we go. So I'm glad that this is one of the times we're really doing something that makes sense from both a scientific and then as Amr pointed out, a public safety benefit. So that it's not just public health, it's not just the science, it's also public safety. And, I, and to touch on that more, really the idea here is that we have seen that our communities feel safe with the way that we're currently punishing powder cocaine. So now that we know that the benefits or the pharmacological, um, I shouldn't say benefits, the pharmacological substance is the same, what, what safety interest is served by punishing the exact same substance at a higher rate? And the reality is there isn't one, right? And so in over, and this probably hasn't been mentioned yet, but in over 40 states, we've seen the disparities move to one to one. And what you hear from prosecutors around the country is this has not made our communities less safe. In fact, it's done quite the opposite. It's allowed, and Matthew touched on this earlier with his own experience, it's allowed people who have been engaged with the system to, yes, be held accountable, but two, to have hope and an option to get their lives back on track. And we are building out the resources for those individuals. We saw it in the first step back at the federal level. We're seeing it at states across the country. So we're finally starting to invest in individuals who have had, you know, past issues or sentences and provide them with an opportunity to be reintegrated into communities and be a part of the public safety solution. The problem is when you have a disparity like this, how do you convince those individuals who are receiving an unfair sentence that they deserve or will be given the same opportunities that those that are? And I think from our perspective as prosecutors, we have a responsibility to the community to make sure that the individuals who are held accountable actually have an opportunity to be part of the public safety solution. And that's where we've failed by not being on board on efforts like this. And I think that's where prosecutors can offer kind of that new perspective, um, really focusing on the fact that one, in the states that we've seen this change made, we aren't seeing a significant increase in crime. I think two, that we're seeing the individuals who come through these sentences, who have their, their sentences reduced retroactively, that they're producing and showing and showing up to events like this and working on policies like this to help communities become stronger and help build trust in our criminal justice system. And then third, I think from an interesting element is on the retroactive piece, we're not taking a tool away from prosecutors or law enforcement. I think that's a misperception when we look at sentencing bills and others, that we're, we're disarming the ability for law enforcement and prosecutors to keep communities safe. That's not the case here. What we're doing instead is making sure that the sentences we provide when we do hold individuals accountable are proportional to the science, the facts, and the data. Prosecutors and a lot of us went to law school are not scientists, so I appreciated the science lesson because I need it more than most folks. I think our members do. But the reality here is that we're not doing this based on any facts or data that will make communities safer. So we're not taking a tool away. Rather, we're making a tool more effective, and we're giving those individuals who are you know, appropriately, I wouldn't say punished, but held accountable under those tools, the opportunity to improve their lives. And so as we continue to build out these structures, build out these systems that support individuals who are incarcerated, one of the main steps we have to provide them with is hope on the front end based on the science data and, and information that we now have 
that allow prosecutors to take the right steps to make sure that, yes, we're holding individuals accountable, but two, we're giving them those opportunities if they are. And, and I'll, I'll finish with this. You'll hear and you've already heard that it's a moral issue and that ending this disparity will end a disproportionate impact on communities of color, communities of lower income. But more importantly, it's also a common sense issue. There's no public safety interest served now through the factual data by over punishing individuals. And in fact, it cuts the other way. It reduces trust in the criminal justice system. It leaves individuals who want to be reintegrated into our society in a safe way and be a contributor. It takes away that hope from them. And so it builds out and hurts the cycle of crime more than it actually helps. So this is that proactive step that is a common sense solution to actually build out and improve public safety rather than reduce it in the ways that we are by having some of these unjust laws on the books. Frank, thank you so much for that. I think it's really important for people that might be thinking about this or how to pitch it to their boss. They're gonna get those questions um, when they hear, you know, what, how's this gonna impact our public safety? And the way that you're talking about public safety as being a partnership with people who are exiting the system. You know, they have to have hope. They have to have wraparound services, which you're talking about. It's gotta be part of the discussion. Um, and when you have something so unfair and it's not based in science, and I'm not a scientist either, but you know, I can see um, what Nikichi's talking about when she says that. And then Amra's telling us about the disparate impact. There is, like you said, a feeling of unfairness and that can really affect people's outcomes. And I think that's such a smart point. Um, to follow up on those points, um, we do have some questions coming in, but I'm going to turn it over to Heather. Um, she's got a, a wealth of knowledge and experience in this area um, and has been a wonderful ally to people who are exiting the system and need services. So Heather, if you could tell us a little bit about um, you know, this, this topic, and we've seen some um, conservative and faith group support for the Equal Act. How do you think this bill advances values that those communities care about? Because I do want to point out again uh, in the House, HR 1693-1693, it does have bipartisan support. So this, you know, we all know that the era we're living in in Congress, um, but we're looking to build a coalition for evidence-based changes to the law. And um, we're, you know, gaining support from a lot of conservative groups. And, um, you know, we have uh, Republican co-leads on this bill in the House. So Heather, uh, if you can give us some more information about that and, and um, some points for um, how people can talk to their, their boss and their communities about this bill. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, always a joy to be working on criminal justice reform, which I love to tell people is one of the last bipartisan issues left in Congress and love convening with this group of panelists, I think it's um, just wonderful that there are issues that we can agree on uh, just coming from different angles. And I uh, wanna thank FAM for co-hosting this with us and just um, working uh, so much and on prioritizing this issue before Congress. And I wanna thank the congressional staffers who are here given of their afternoon. I know we are all zoomed out. So thank you for taking time to think about this issue right now. And you know, this is an issue that the faith community cares deeply about. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Proverbs 11.1, 1, which says that the Lord detests dishonest scales, uh, but accurate weights find favor with him. And I think that uh, this bill is getting at trying to find a, an equal um, and proportional punishment for crack cocaine, and that this is really a long time coming. Um, we know also that Proverbs calls us to speak up and judge righteously for the poor and needy. And we know, as has already been lined out by many of our, our panelists here, this policy has negatively in, uh, affected communities who are living in poverty, communities of color. And I think right now what our culture is looking to the Christian community for is to be a consistent witness. Um, they know a lot of the issues that we care deeply about, um, but they're, they're looking to see where we stand on justice issues. And I think that there's a lot of complexity to why we have racial disparities in the system. But if there were to be one piece of legislation I could point to that this is an obvious change that needs to be make, made to, a, to address racial injustice, this would be it. And so I think for those of you listening who are um, advising your bosses on, on these issues and if they, they care about this from a faith perspective, it's important to talk about this as an opportunity 
um, to really right a wrong. Um, and it, it doesn't, you know, whether whether you um, look back at the history that Nikichi outlined for us, you know, whatever your opinion was on, on what people's intentions were. And thank you, Nikichi, for that vulnerability of sharing, you know, that, that even you had, uh, you know, a difference of opinion at the time. I think a lot of people did. Um, but what matters is what we know now, right? And what we know now tells us that the right and moral and just thing to do is to equalize these punishments. Uh, and so, you know, people like Matthew Charles behind bars, people behind bars have human dignity and that does not get lost when the prison door shut. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that people are still serving decades upon decades for crack cocaine offenses when if they had just been um, caught with the same amount of powder cocaine, they'd be serving a vastly different punishment. You know, to Frank's point, that doesn't serve public safety. Um, to Amra's point, we, we know that this has disproportionately affected black and brown communities. And so this is our opportunity to right that wrong. And the Bible has a lot to say about redemption. And so I think, you know, this bill is about redemption. And I hope that the members of Congress who were here decades before and those who are new to office will all step up to the plate and, and push this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, I think that perspective um, and the humanity with which you approach this topic is really important because oftentimes, um, you know, when we're thinking about policy, it can be easy to forget about what it means for the individual um, and, and the community, right? And so what we're hearing from this panel right now is that individuals um, like Matthew and others who are serving time, they have dignity. What an important point for all of us to remember. Um, you know, from Frank, we're talking about fairness and proportionality. And, you know, um, what Nikichi brought up about, you know, the humility to express that one has to educate oneself all the time about these issues and, and maybe reposition and think about that. And the wonderful advocacy work of Amra and the ACLU in kind of just consistent, you know, this has got to be one to one <laughs> and that these compromises are really um, you know, they are a product of legislation and wheeling and dealing, but not of science. I think that's really important too. So, you know, our panelists um, are open for questions um, and we're seeing a couple of really great, great questions that are coming through. Um, so one thing I will say is there is a question from this great group of um, people attending the seminar. Um, if this bill is passed, what will retroactivity sentencing look like um, would the retroactive piece or the retroactive relief overload the, overload <laughs> the court system? And I think this is a really great question. This is something, you know, if you're looking at this bill, um, I'll remind the staffers on the call, it's only about two to three pages. So you can take a look pretty quickly. Um, and it is a very, you know, targeted bill at this um, sentencing reform, but there is a retroactive piece. So if any of our panelists would like to answer that question, um, the question again is, would retroactive relief overload the court system? And what does that look like um, when you have some retroactivity to a bill? Sure, if I can jump in and answer. So we've actually gone through this before. The courts have gone through this before and they've handled it well. Um, we had mentioned, we've mentioned some of us during our conversation that the original 100 to 1 disparity was changed in 2010 to 18 to 1. So going forward, that was a change that applied to people, but it didn't apply retroactively to people who had been sentenced prior to 2010. So in 2018, when the First Step Act was enacted into law with with amazing bipartisan support in Congress and President Trump signed it into law. One of the things that that bill did was it made the 18 to 1 ratio retroactive so that people who had been sentenced prior to 2010 could file a motion in court or a prosecutor could file a motion in court for them um, and ask that they be resentenced based on the 18 to 1 ratio and the and the new sentencing structure. So that process started at the end of 2018. Thousands of motions were filed in federal courts throughout the country um, and the courts processed those motions. They, they the process does not result in automatic relief or guaranteed relief. 
it is a litigation process. So a motion is filed, the government gets notice of the motion, the prosecutor gets to file an opposition, or if they agree, and in many cases they did, which was wonderful, then they will file that document saying that they agree, they can ask for a hearing, and the judge gets to hear all the evidence that he or she wants to hear and adjudicate the case, and has to follow all of the sentencing laws that they always have to follow when they impose a sentence. And so that process happened over the last few years. There are probably a few more motions still trickling in, but there were thousands of motions. I think over 3,600 motions were granted. And, um, you know, the courts, the courts were able to do it, the prosecutors were able to do it, the public defenders were able to do it. Um, and so we've had a recent experiment with this and it's been successful. And Nina, I wanna also say, um, along with what Amara uh, said, uh, even before the uh, 2018 um, First Step Act that um, made that part um, uh, retroactive, even before, this is kind of techy techy, but, the U.S. Sentencing Commission, the sentencing guidelines were made retroactive much earlier on um, under the drugs minus two is techie stuff. But anyway, there were no issues or problems with that either. So that must happen now with the mandatory minimum um, statute that's um, uh, being proposed as part of the Equal Act. So. And I'll just throw in, also, oh, go ahead, Matthew. No, Sorry, you go, Frank. Frank. I was just gonna say very quickly that, sorry, that they've also resourced this area so that the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Bureau of Prisons, uh, the courts are actually able to, out of that first step back, to have more resources for this process. So with the process in place, even coming out of the pandemic, there will be a rush of cases. I don't wanna pretend that there's not, um, but we're well equipped to handle these actually probably better than some of the other areas of, of the law that will, will be kind of tested under the next few months. I think that's an excellent point. Um, you know, we've had the retroactivity provisions of previous criminal justice reform, as Amra said. Um, you know, Nikiji's talking about the Sentencing Commission, and then Frank is letting us know that the courts are geared up for, with the apparatus, which, as we all know, on Capitol Hill, it's one thing to say something, but how it gets done in practice is really important. So that's a great question. Um, and then if I could just add, it would be fundamentally unfair to say as Congress, you know, if they were to enact the Equal Act and say that this is unfair to leave people languishing in prison um, under the, the, you know, the guise or the kind of like false thinking that, well, we just forget about those people, right? When we talk about Heather's point about dignity, you know, if, you, if you're gonna correct a mistake, you should correct it for people who are serving those sentences in custody too. Um, and I'm sure Matthew could add something to that too as well. Thank you, Nina. Yes, you touched on it. Frank touched on it. Actually, when I bumped heads with him a few minutes, as we both started talking at the same time, uh, courts are geared toward, as you uh, stated, as well as Armour. The fact that uh, even as Congressman Robert Scott stated, you know, there is a racial disparity between us. So the injustice is not just something that is harmless error. It's something that is negatively affected, as Heather has stated, the Black and Brown communities of color. But also, when you look at it, you got to look at it from as we already stated here on the uh, issue as well, from a moral perspective, we understand that we got it wrong. Nikishi stated in 1998 and 1986, people didn't fully understand it. So there was fear. There was a need to act. And there was a misunderstanding of crack cocaine and powder cocaine. Well, all the panelists have stated and the data and the research have proven that there's no pharmacological difference between those two drug types. And because of that, now we're reassessing the mistakes that we made in the past and to say, okay, we want to pass this equal act, break, bringing it down to one to one and not make it retro. I wouldn't even be on this panel today if it wasn't for retroactivity. It was based on the 2018 uh, signing of the First Step Act that had a provision in it making retroactive those 2010 changes that I'm free today. Now, I want to go back and just take this and then I'll leave it alone. In 2010, when it changed to 18 to one, it wasn't made retroactive. I was happy that that change was made because I was sentenced under the 100 to one ratio and received a 20 year excessive sentence for that. So I was glad that it had stopped. But also I was kind of disheartened because I still was incarcerated under my 100 to one sentence when now it was 18 to one and there was no rationale for me being sentenced to that 35 year sentence any longer. But it wasn't that I was incarcerated and upset about it. I was like, wow, I'm glad that they're now addressing this issue. But whenever you utilize people to show the wrongness of a situation 
and then say those people don't matter and leave them under those conditions, that's just not morally right. I mean, that's not even humanly right. That's just, you know, so therefore, you know, retroactivity, the courts can handle it. They've done it in the past and we've stated here and it needs to be done on this issue as well. I've got another great question from our attendees. Um, what are some of the most common arguments against eliminating the disparity and how do you respond to them? And I think this is really important because when we examine an issue, um, there are gonna be people out there who are wondering if this is the right move, um, why it's important um, and, and how do we respond to that? Because I think that you know all of you have made, re made really great points about why we should do this. So let's kind of put on a different angle and think about what you know someone who's skeptical might be thinking about this. Just really quickly, I'll, I'll say some of the pushback we've got and, and we're able to overcome, I think, is the question about retroactivity, right? So as folks say, well, well, are you questioning the decisions of prosecutors and law enforcement 20 years ago, right? Back when we had a different understanding, fair enough, but they felt that that was the appropriate sentence. And, and I argue back that we're not, um, specifically because of the direct comparison to the powder cocaine. Uh, if you look at that, we felt that those sentences were appropriate for community safety. And now you compare it to the exact same substance and say, well, we shouldn't change that? Well, no, we should. We already know that that individual who, let's say, was just you know possessing just powder cocaine versus the individual who's possessing crack cocaine, an individual possessing crack cocaine has already probably overserved what we felt was appropriate to keep the community safe and have, you know, retribution be provided. So I think that may be the, the good pushback for retroactivity that we have an identical substance. We agree this is the appropriate sentence. So why in the world for 20 plus years and why should we not look back at those individuals and say, you have overserved and that we owe you is the opportunity to, to be reintegrated into society. One other um, pushback I've heard and that I think we've also been able to address is um, the notion that crack cocaine is more addictive than powder cocaine. And Nikichi talked a little bit about uh, what we found in terms of the data. Um, but one of the reasons I think that that um, still continues to be a narrative is because as crack versus powder cocaine is administered, um, there is a faster reaction in one's body to crack versus powder cocaine. Um, but there are also other factors besides the form of the drug that play a role, things like if you've been consuming alcohol, um, the person's body size. And so should we start you know, forming up punishments based on those factors as well? Um, I, I think not. I think we need to have a consistent proportional punishment for the drug type um, and that um, those those factors, you know, there's so many factors at play that it's not just to, you know, pinpoint on, on that one. And we know from all of the data that was shared earlier from our panelists uh, that really these are two forms of the same drug uh, and so therefore should have equalized punishment. And I just like to comment as well, because even Frank, you know, the fact that uh, retroactivity, a lot, of, a lot of times people equate retroactivity with uh, setting a bunch of prisoners free, uh, not prisoners that deserve to be free, but it's just setting prisoners free. And we come to understand that the reason that these people are incarcerated, and as Frank stated, a lot of them have already served the appropriate sentence. I myself served seven years longer because I served 22 years, seven years longer once it was made retroactive than I should have actually served. So it's not like that the people are just be, being set free because even as Congress stated, there's a process. There's a petition filed with the sentence in court and you go through the motions because the uh, prosecutor get the way in on the situation as well. So we're just stating that uh, there shouldn't be any real pushback when it comes to retroactivity. There shouldn't be any real pushback on the issue itself because now in 2021, 2022, uh, we understand that we got it wrong in the past and we want justice to be even handed. And if we know that there's no difference between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, why are people still being sentenced differently? And it goes back to, if you was to ask a person that have never heard about this issue, about the disparity between crack and powder, the first question that probably will come out of a sensible person's mouth is, why are they sentenced to more uh, time than the person for uh, powder cocaine? And now because of the research and data, we can say there's absolutely no reason that exists today. In the past, there was because there was a misunderstanding of fear and a lot was going on. But today, we understand that there's no real reason why there's a difference. So in answer to that question, we need to ask the leaders of our country who is able to say uh, change those things. I think those comments are really wonderful and they make a lot of sense. And they, you know, they shed a lot of light on Heather's point in particular about 
the power of narratives and how this false narrative was created around crack when Frank is saying, you know, you have this exact same substance control group in cocaine, powder cocaine is a control group and that you can see the sentences there. And Akichi's talking about how powerful that narrative was on all of our um, minds and it influenced our legislators. Um, I've got another great question. Um, Frank had mentioned earlier um, that states don't use the disparity or that some states have reformed their criminal code to get rid of this kind of disparity. Um, what were the consequences of those reforms um, and could that influence you know, federal legislators? If anybody can speak to that because sometimes you'll hear a very common phrase on Capitol Hill, um, states as laboratories, right? So let's see what the laboratories are up to. I can lead off quickly and just say, you know, it, it's a majority of states, and I think that's important to note. I think it's over 40 now, and, and each of those states, you've seen prosecutors' mentalities change, where they've actually supported the efforts the same way they're at the federal level. Why? Um, it's exactly what we said. It's a common sense thing that, that our members are saying, well, we're not stopping the ability to hold anyone accountable, but we're actually improving the, the trust in the system. And two, we're not seeing increased recidivism rates by those individuals who were released early. And you can point actually back to the federal system and the first step back and what we've seen in the reports from the sentencing commission there, um, that the individuals who were released under those provisions are recidivating at a lesser rate than the uh, individuals released you know, under the, the current laws. So the, those two kind of pieces, both in the federal and state level, have shown this is successful, it's working, and more importantly, it's getting buy-in back into a system that at this time in our country's history is struggling in, in, in a good way to, to get, get in support and make sure that we have the folks who feel like they're both kept safe and treated fairly under the law. And then um, we've got another great question. Um, someone wanted to know, what are the types of investments in our justice system and communities that could be supported by passing the EQUAL Act and reducing over-incarceration in federal prisons? Um, and I know that, you know, re-entry and community wraparound services, those have been a big part of the narrative in criminal justice reform. So. How does the Equal Act, if we're able to pass this bill, um, you know, what are the investments we can make in our justice system and communities um, to help with this issue in the United States of mass incarceration? Yeah, I'll speak to that for a moment. You know, I think that there are a lot of grant programs that have been put in place over the years to really provide a more holistic response um, to uh, incarceration. And a lot of those grants go out to community organizations, faith-based organizations who are working in the reentry space. We know since COVID-19, um, there's a report out by Center for State Government's Justice Center about just sort of the decimation of reentry organizations and how they're really struggling at this point in time um, to provide those wraparound services and make sure that people are successful upon release. Uh, so, you know, I think we could see more investments towards this instead of incarceration. Um, there's also, of course, a lot of discussion around policing, and we know that more training is needed um, for law enforcement. So I think that's another thing for members to be thinking about. And I've seen a couple of questions come in to sort of like, when will this pass? What's the holdup? Um, and so I also just want to say, you know, for those of you still listening who um, perhaps are briefing your boss on this bill, and if they haven't co-sponsored yet, you know, Nina mentioned uh, you know, it's been great to see the bipartisan support, not only of um, Congressman Scott, who spoke, and Congressman Jeffries on this bill, but Congressman Kelly Armstrong and Congresswoman um, McMorris Rogers is on this the House bill. And also in the, in the Senate side, not only are Senator Booker and Durbin leading, but also Senator Portman. And so I think we're starting to see that bipartisan support come together. And I think, you know, the, the next steps are really to continue adding co-sponsors. So if your boss has not co-sponsored yet, I'd really encourage you to, after this, brief your boss. If there are questions you still have that we don't get to today, we'd love to follow up with you and answer those. Um, and then, you know, it's a matter of just pushing things forward. It's always a matter of priorities. And so if you're someone who's on Judiciary Committee or knows other members who are, push them to, you know, talk about this, to do a markup of this um, bill. And um, that's going to allow us to move this forward. I think, you know, from our perspective, it's a matter of time, but there needs to be that critical momentum. And that's what we see building right now. Absolutely. And Nina, I would say also, in addition to um, the investments uh, that Heather spoke about, I think that there's also an investment in much more public confidence in the criminal justice system. For a system to be just, the public must be confident that every stage that like persons and like circumstances are 
treated uh, the same. And going back to what Frank was saying earlier is that uh, uh, the, 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 legis the, the law as it stands now actually reduces that confidence and reduces that uh, trust in the criminal uh, justice uh, system. It, and it, um, uh, it, it, it reduces public safety. It, 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 it has a negative impact on the cycle of crime. So one investment is an investment in confidence in the system. Absolutely. And for those, um, the, the questions that we're seeing about, you know, what's the holdup? Um, what's the status of the bill? If you look in the chat function, I've created a link to the text on congress.gov. It is a short bill. So if you have any questions, and I'd like to remind people too, the panelists here today, they're all advocates and part of wonderful organizations that are, you know, just invaluable in my work on the Hill um, in terms of having questions answered, um, understanding issues. So, you know, jot down some names and feel free to reach out um, because I think that that's, that's a resource that we are lucky to have, um, that all of these panelists are, uh, you know, they understand the background and the history. Um, the status of the bill is it has been introduced in the House and in the Senate, as Amrus pointed out. Um, if you have any questions about the, um, the process, please feel free to ping me as well. Um, but yes, Heather's absolutely right. The more co-sponsors that uh, arrive on a bill like this, the more that we can get both parties to talk about this issue, um, the more likely it is to come to the floor and pass out of committee as well. So um, there's the magic number of co-sponsors that will get it automatically to the floor, but um, you know, anywhere from you know, 50 to 100 co-sponsors starts to get a bill um, to be noticed. And for those of you that have pointed out that um, President Biden is opposed to the mandatory minimums and is interested um, and supports the idea of reducing um, this disparity and putting it as a one-to-one -one ratio, um, even better, right? When we have the White House support, then that means our job in Congress is to get a bill passed through. So I'm just gonna open it up for any closing remarks from our wonderful panelists today. And I'm gonna let everybody um, say one last thing and then we can close out today's wonderful panel. We'll start All right, I'll her. start there. <laughs> okay, I'll start there uh, since I'm the least expert on the panel. No, it's just that, you know, like I said, it's a no-brainer when it comes to this issue. Uh, to me, it is. That's the reason I said uh, less than an expert conversation. But anyway, it's a no-brainer because it needs to be made one-to-one. -one. There's no justification why it remains at 18 and one. There was really no justification why it was 100 to one. And today we see that we now look at the laws a little bit different, especially the things that have been happening uh, nationally, you know, over the past years that, uh, as Heather has stated, this is something that we can actually change that will have a great impact because it devastated uh, communities of color. You know what I mean? And therefore making this uh, wrong right is something that will be, I think, vital to our nation as a whole. I'll be even briefer. Um, when you have prosecutors, public defenders, the court system, the major city chiefs of police all on the same page, I think that shows that this really is the right fix at the right time for our criminal justice system. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, this is long overdue. It is the right thing to do. And just going back to the strategy of adding co-sponsors, I, I not only want to encourage you, you, if you're briefing your boss on this bill, to add them as a co-sponsor, but if there's a member of the opposite party that you work closely with on other issues, consider asking them to join you, you know, joining groups. We'd love to see that um, momentum continue to build in a bipartisan fashion. And, you know, I Frank Russo took the words right out of my mouth. When you have the National Association for District Attorneys, and a formerly incarcerated person like Matthew Charles on the same panel, as well as FAM, Nikichi, who's been advocating for change for a very long time, prison fellowship, um, and the ACLU all agreeing on something. That's, that's a, I think, a really impressive thing. And I hope that Congress takes notice and sees that if there's agreement here, it's probably because it's a really great policy and it's time to enact it. So I'll say we're definitely on the same mind length here because Amara, what I was gonna say is that no matter what vantage point we find ourselves, whether whatever motivates you, whether it's fiscal concerns, whether it's big government, whether it's race, whether it's um, redemption, you know, whatever it is, this is an issue that we can all come together on. This is an issue that we can all agree on. And this is an issue that must happen, must pass right now.
Absolutely. Thank you again to Prison Fellowship and Families Against Mandatory Minimums for hosting today's wonderful webinar. Um, anyone who has questions, please feel free to reach out to us and our organizations. Our panelists, thank you so much for shedding so much light and wisdom on this topic. And hopefully we can all work together to pass the Equal Act. Um, thank you again and everyone take care.